results to change the status quo in California. In California, for decades now, we have made a conscious decision that having enough housing simply doesn't matter. And we've done that through our policy choices by making it harder and harder to get new housing, by having extreme low density zoning, even near public transportation, uh, and by, by just not having enough housing and making it almost impossible to get the housing that we need. This bill addresses California's massive housing shortage in a meaningful way by allowing more housing near public transportation, exactly where it should be, to allow small apartment buildings near transit with an affordability requirement, with demolition restrictions, and with tenant protections, all of which are in this bill. Um, there's been a lot of talk about high-rises. One particularly hyperbolic statement by a member of the Los Angeles City Council said that this bill would turn Los Angeles into Dubai. That, of course, is not true. We are talking about four- and five-story small apartment buildings, the kind that we used to build quite a bit of in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, but got banned in many places when we downzoned many of our cities in the 70s and the 80s. SB 827, over time, will lead to housing that is more affordable, sustainable, and equitable. Currently, many transit hubs are surrounded by hyper-low density zoning. This is true in my city of San Francisco, where we have subways that are completely surrounded by single-family homes. It's true of BART stations, Caltrain stations, LA Metro stations, and so forth. By restricting the amount of housing around public transportation, what we are saying is that we don't want very many people to live near transit. This pushes people away from transit, it makes housing less affordable, it exacerbates gridlock, and it undermines our climate goals. Uh, we know that uh, there is a history with this kind of zoning. It's called exclusionary zoning. There was a book recently published, The Color of Law, by Richard Rothman, talking about this history. And Richard Rothman <coughs> is among the, the academics who have endorsed SB 827. It is self-defeating to ban apartment buildings near public transit, and that's what this bill will remedy. Local control over housing is important, but it's not biblical. I'm a former local elected official, and I believe in local control in many contexts. Local control is a means to achieve positive outcomes. And when local control isn't producing good outcomes, we need to reevaluate that balance. In many contexts, we balance state and local control, whether on education or health care. We would never say that public education, that the state should have no role. Yet that is what we have effectively done on housing. For many years, and that is starting to change in the last few years, we have effectively said to local communities, you can do whatever you want on housing. You can opt out entirely. You can make it impossible to build housing. That's your choice. Uh, zero state role. Some have asserted that SB 827 wipes away all local control, and that is completely untrue. SB 827 retains significant local control while setting baseline density standards near transit. SB 827 does not touch the local approval process for individual projects. Conditional use, CEQA, that will remain. It does not change design standards. It does not change local demolition controls, except to sometimes make them stricter. It does not override local inclusionary. Local inclusionary will apply. It does not change local impact fees for sewers or transit or parks or schools. Those will remain. It does not change whether a parcel is zoned residential in the first place. SB 827 only applies if a city has zoned the parcel residential. SB 827 simply sets a new balance around one aspect, density around public transportation. It is not acceptable to invest hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on tra public transportation systems and then allow only a small number of people to live nearby. And as we add those 3.6 million homes that are our housing deficit, uh, we don't want to continue to do what we've always done, to cover up farmland and open space and just go out and out and out. That is not sustainable. 
We need to add those homes near public transportation in our job centers, and yet current zoning often makes that impossible. Um, SBA 27 promotes exactly the kind of housing that we need. Um, it applies uh, within a half a mile uh, of a uh, subway or a light rail, fixed rail stop, or a quarter mile of a high frequency bus stop. Um, we have redefined uh, the definition of high frequency bus stop and scaled it back significantly so it has to run regularly from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, during the week uh, and from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. on the weekend. Good service, day and night, um, seven days a week. The ma it, it requires or prohibits cities from pushing maximum heights below either 45 or 55 feet, depending on the circumstances. Uh, we amended the bill to remove the 85-foot category because that was causing significant concern. And throughout this process, colleagues, uh, we have listened to feedback both from supporters and from people who absolutely hate the bill. Uh, I have met with supporters. I have met with opponents. I read everything that is sent to me. And we have incorporated feedback into this bill, including from people who are fighting the bill. Good ideas are good ideas no matter who they come from. Uh, so SB 827 contains some of the strongest anti-displacement rules that will ever be that have ever been adopted in state law. It places a ban on demolishing rent-controlled homes, a blanket ban, unless a city council affirmatively passes an ordinance allowing it. It bans demolitions if there's been an Ellis Act eviction on the property in the last five years. It creates tenant protections with a right of return, so if someone is displaced, the developer has to pay for up to three and a half years to put them up somewhere else, uh, somewhere nearby, a comparable unit, so they're not paying any more, and they have a right to return to a comparable unit in the new building at the same rent. Uh, SBA 27 projects have an affordability requirement. We imported the state affordable housing density bonus into the bill depending on the size of the project, uh, and this will lead to a significant increase in affordable units, because we will now be building more apartment buildings that will be either subject to local inclusionary, or if there is local inclusion, no local inclusionary uh, to the state density bonus. This will lead to a significant increase in below market rate units. Let's talk about displacement. It's a huge problem. And it's a huge problem in California during a period where we haven't built very much housing. Building new housing, if it's done right, does not cause displacement. It's a failure to build new housing that causes displacement. And the proof is in the pudding in communities that are experiencing severe displacement during periods when not much housing uh, was built. We have a broad coalition supporting this bill. Um, I, we have uh, affordable housing organizations, and you will hear uh, from one of them, uh, the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California, uh, Silicon Valley at Home, Habitat for Humanity, Bridge Housing, uh, and I'll quote from the, uh, M from the NPH letter. NPH supports SB 827 as a matter of principle in that it will be a major tool to co combat restrictive and exclusionary zoning that's contributed to the Bay Area's and California's concentration of wealth and opportunity for the few to the detriment of the many. We have support from the environmental community, including NRDC, Environment California, and Climate Resolve. Quote, the shortage of affordable housing in California is decades in the making. Uh, a failure to maximize transit opportunities and to allow adequate housing, including affordable housing, near those transportation centers has contributed to displacement, longer commutes, more vehicle miles traveled, increased greenhouse gas emissions, loss of open space, and worsening urban sprawl. SBA 27 represents the scale of action necessary to meaningfully address the affordable housing and environment crisis. We received a letter from 17 scholars, uh, fair housing and civil rights scholars, including uh, Richard Rothstein. Uh, SBA 27, quote, is a significant and laudable effort to attack the problem of racial and economic segregation, both directly and indirectly. It's a, quote, major step towards promoting integration and reducing racial residential segregation. From a letter from urban planning experts. 
Uh, by, uh, it's always been within the power, quote, of local governments to alleviate this crisis, but they have consistently failed to act. Our housing crisis is a preventable and self-inflicted catastrophe. And from business leaders, uh, we received a letter from 120 CEOs telling us that they support SB 27 and that the status quo is harming California's economy. Um, I want to uh, just acknowledge clearly there's a lot of support for this bill and there is a lot of opposition. To, uh, to the opponents, uh, I, have, uh, I hear you. Uh, I have been listening and reading uh, what you say, what you write. Uh, there are times when I disagree, there are times when I've agreed, and we've incorporated some of that feedback into the bill. Uh, reasonable minds can differ on many different housing issues. Um, we have listened and taken amendments around affordability, anti-displacement measures, eliminating the 85 feet. Uh, we've also eliminated height increases around buses. The height increases will kick in only around uh, fixed rail. Um, a stricter definition of what qualifies as high-frequency bus stop. Uh, we made a clarifying amendment to make very clear that the bill does not affect local CEQA or conditional use uh, processes. And we put a delayed implementation into the bill of two years and potentially three years to give local communities time to prepare. Uh, we will continue to work with both supporters and opponents of the bill. Uh, we want this to be a group effort. We want this to be a big tent. Uh, and I look forward to that collaboration. Uh, colleagues, I know that this bill is controversial. Uh, it has triggered a long overdue statewide debate precisely because it does something that will impact California positively and because housing matters. That's why it's generated this debate. SBA 27 will make a difference for our state. It will not have the catastrophic and apocalyptic effects that some opponents are asserting. Uh, it will move us in a positive direction. It will help us with this housing mess that we are facing today. Uh, and I respectfully ask for your I vote. Uh, with me today as witnesses are Michael Lane uh, from the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California, an umbrella organization for many affordable housing organizations, and Bless Shepherd from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Thank you. Welcome. Speaker's favor, please. Chairman Bell, members. Uh, Senator Weiner has taken amendments that significantly reduce the scope and reach of this bill and it moved to address concerns around inclusionary housing requirements and displacement and those amendments helped to draw our support. Senator Weiner has acknowledged this bill is a work in progress and we believe it should be supported today so we can continue to work with him in good faith to continue to refine and improve the bill and we make our commitment to you to continue to do that. We are still producing housing in this state at historically low levels and the scarcity of properly zoned multifamily housing sites is a major problem. SB 827 would unlock thousands of new multifamily parcels near transit for market rate housing with an inclusionary component, but also for 100% affordable developments in precisely the locations prioritized by the Strategic Growth Council Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, which is funded by cap and trade resources, and by the California Tax Credit Allocation Program. This is the right policy and it's already embedded uh, in the financing systems that the state has, has brought forward for affordable housing. We urge your uh, I vote today to allow us to continue to move forward and refine this bill. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, other speakers. Good afternoon, Chair and members. Bless Shepard, representing the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. The Leadership Group worked with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation to look at the effects of the housing crisis on our region. The report, called the Silicon Valley Competitiveness and Innovation Project, found that between 2010 and 2016, the Silicon Valley had a new job growth at 29%, and while only having new housing growth of 4%. Our lack of housing deeply threatens our innovation economy. In 2016, we saw a region, in our region, we saw more net folks leaving the Silicon Valley rather than coming. The net 50 residents each month leaving is a sharp reversal of migration of nearly 2,000 new residents each month the previous year. 
Collectively, leadership group members provide nearly one out of every three private sector jobs in Silicon Valley. In every conversation we've had with our uh, executives, we hear about workforce recruitment and uh, retention as our number one threat to our economy. Our companies are struggling to attract and keep employees at all levels because of the cost of housing. We need to construct more homes for all Californians so that our region, our workers, and, our, and their families can prosper and thrive. SB 827 represents the smart growth that we need in our communities, oh, higher I density see. near public transit. It leverages the billions of public and private investment in our public transit. SB 827 is the formula to continue and build and uh, grow in an existing urban area and we hope to continue the conversation with you. Um, this is such an important conversation. We urge your I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have people that want to support this bill, please. Mr. Chair, members, Justin Malone for the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're very much in support. We acknowledge concerns over displacement. We look forward to working with you on that. We have the people just to identify who they are and their position on the bill, please. Sure, Mr. Chairman and members, Greg Hayes here on behalf of Link Lift in strong support of the bill. Aaron Guerrero on behalf of the California Building Industry Association, also in strong support. Jennifer Speck on behalf of the California Association of Realtors, also in strong support. Sean Tepakin on behalf of the California Apartment Association in support. Holly Fermini, Lighthouse Public Affairs, on behalf of Habitat for Humanity California, in support. Louis Morante, on behalf of California EMB, the sponsors. We're interested in working uh, f uh, with opponents of the bill on amendments, and thank you for uh, bringing forth this legislation. Uh, we're in support. Brian White, on behalf of the California Housing Alliance, also in support. Uh, Tim Schott, on behalf of the San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District. Bart has a supportive amend position. Thank you. Adam Regley on behalf of the Cal Chamber, also in support. On behalf of the local and nationwide Cal API Chamber of Commerce in support. Madison Dwelly on behalf of the so Silicon Valley Community Foundation in support. Jay Albudesevier with the California Credit Union League in support. Uh, Jason Crawford, Burlingame voter and San Mateo business owner in support. Victoria Fierce, co-executive of East Bay for Everyone, representative of 900 plus renters in the East Bay in support. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Justin Fans on behalf of TechNet, Up for Growth, and Holland Partner Growth. Holland Partner Group, all in support. Thank you. Uh, Wes Sams with United Ways of California in support. We appreciate the amendments. Tim Colon on behalf of the 300 members of the San Francisco Housing Action Coalition in strong support. Laura Clark on behalf of the 1,300 members of the Yimby Action located in the Bay Area in very strong support. Please help us. Garrett Christensen, UC Berkeley economist, Oakland resident on my own behalf in support. Mr. Chairman and members, Moira Top on behalf of Orange County Business Council in support. Mr. Chairman and members, Aaron Nimala representing Bridge Housing and also Salesforce in support. Max Gens, San Francisco renter, also on behalf of my quadriplegic brother who requires accessible modern housing near transit, in strong support. Matt Regan from the Bay Area Council, in support. Sylvia Cotto from the 200 San Diego, in support. John Gamboa, President, California Community Builders, in support. Ron Chavez, uh, representing Ventura County Community Development Corporation, in support. Any other supporters, please? Okay, we'd like to have the opponents come forward, please. Those that do not support this legislation. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Anya Lawler on behalf of the Western Center on Lump Poverty and the California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation. On behalf of my organization and the many, many other equity, social justice, and affordable housing organizations who have deep concerns about this bill, let me start by saying that we support high density development and have in fact fought for decades to remove bar barriers to density and ensure that all cities and counties are zoning sufficiently and for multifamily housing. We support higher density development around transit and we support ending exclusionary zoning 
lending practices that have for decades been used to shut the door on lower income people and particularly people of color in some communities throughout this state. We support producing an adequate supply of housing affordable to a range of incomes and building equitable, inclusive, economically diverse communities. However, we don't think this bill is the right approach to achieving those goals. A policy that fails to adequately preserve existing sources of affordable housing, protect lower income communities from direct and indirect displacement, and ensure the development of new housing affordable to lower income households is not one that we can support. We're very concerned that state planning mandates, if not carefully crafted, can have significant negative impacts on existing low income communities. We know that the gentrifying effects of increased densities can trigger displacement. We've seen this play out over and over again and we shouldn't continue to repeat the same mistakes, but rather learn from them and use models that have been proven to work to incentivize development in an equitable, inclusive way that is sensitive to local context. By increasing densities around transit, this bill conveys a significant value on existing landowners. We strongly believe that if the state's going to do that, it should do so in a way that ensures that there is an appropriate amount of public benefit conveyed in return. We don't believe the affordability provisions currently in this bill accomplish that. For example, in most instances, a developer would be free to develop housing affordable only to those at 120% of area median income without providing any housing affordable to low and very low income families for whom the housing shortage is far more acute. Moreover, by not requiring housing for lower income households, we exclude core transit riders from an opportunity to benefit from increasing housing supply around transit and instead potentially push those households further out. Further, we've urged the author to protect existing low-income communities by, at a minimum, adopting the same demolition protections here that are included in SB 35. These are not in the bill, and the replacement protections that are in the bill at this time, especially absent resources for enforcement and monitoring, are insufficient and not, as the author says, the strongest that have ever been put into state law. Can you wrap it up, please? Sure. Well, there's been a lot of rhetoric about this bill being the antidote to exclusionary zoning. The reality is that it appears to apply in more lower income areas than higher income ones and doesn't even touch on the most exclusive areas of the state. This bill doesn't go into full effect until 2021. If we can wait that long, would it make more sense to put the bill on hold down, put that time into coming up with a more workable approach next year? There are a lot of shared goals here. This is not as simple as you either support this bill or you don't care about addressing the housing crisis. It's about getting a major policy change right. We need bold action, but we need thoughtful action too. We're open and ready for that conversation. For all the reasons stated, we remain opposed unless amended, and we urge a no vote. Other speakers opposing? Mr. Chair, members, Cesar Diaz on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. I want to echo a lot of what uh, Anya Lawler said. Uh, we do support uh, transient oriented development. We think it's the right way, especially with the housing crisis. We're su very supportive of that. Um, you know, as housing costs continue to rise, it makes perfect sense to advance policies that promote mixed use, affordable housing, and walkable neighborhoods adjacent to frequent and efficient transportation. Our members are affected in every way by this bill, both on the affordable housing side and actual construction opportunities. However, SB 827 does not adequately address important issues such as inclusionary housing, displacement, and important labor protections for construction workers. SB 827 aims to significantly increase high density housing near transit, but the amendments do not go far enough to provide the type of housing working families need. The market rate housing mixed with a third of commercial space it seeks to produce would limit the ability, availability to create affordable housing units even with the proposed inclusionary housing component. We support a process by which the approval of projects is conditioned with mitigation requirements that ensure infrastructure can support the high density housing. This is just better planning that leads to a better project and a better quality of life for residents. But SB 827 does not contain such provisions. Just last year, this legislature passed SB 35 with streamlined mixed use residential development. We supported that bill and worked with the author to make, it, to make sure that the bill met the principles of planning, affordability, and labor protections. It is unknown what the outcome of that policy will be. Rushing to create another streamlining measure adds more pressure on how to pay for the supporting infrastructure. What is the message to cities on how to plan for the future and how to respond to the local impact on communities? We believe the bill lacks this clarity and urge a no vote. Any speakers opposing, please? Yes, sir. My name is John Mirish, and I'm the Vice Mayor of Beverly Hills. I'd like to start by thanking Senator Weiner for bringing the discussion of housing to the forefront. It's a discussion we should all be having. 
But SB 827, not to mention SB 828 and other pending bills, are the wrong prescription for the housing crisis, kind of like trying to cure psoriasis with an appendectomy. Because SB 827 isn't a housing or transit bill. As former LA Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky pointed out, SB 827 is a real estate bill which turns transit into a sales amenity. That's just one reason why SB 827 represents one of the largest wealth transfers from the public to the private sector in state history. Senator Weiner has said he could care less how much money developers make. Well, maybe he should. Maybe he should also be concerned about tech companies bragging about their insane margins and the fact that income inequality itself is one of the major causes of right. the housing can crisis. You, can you wrap it up, please? I mean, and no outburst, no outburst whatsoever. Thank you. In addition to getting multi-billion dollar corporations and profiteer CEOs to pay their fair shares in a separate handout, I've listed seven bullet points about what you can do to deal with our housing crisis, including to acknowledge that top-down peremptory mandates are not suitable for a state as diverse and wide-ranging as California. It's time we finally recognize that the value of our individual communities is, is one of the things that makes California great. And for all your good intentions, it's time we finally stop trying to pass one-size-fits-all laws which treat people like widgets, stats, or marks. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, I'm sorry, um, but we want people to address their name, their organization, and their position on the bill only. Okay, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Andrew Antwi with Shaw Yoder Antwi here today on behalf of the City of Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles City Council voted 13-0. Uh, to oppose uh, SB 827. The City of Los Angeles has spent a lot of time working very deliberately to update all 35 of its community plans and general plans. We believe the provisions of this bill would impact vast swaths of the City of Los Angeles. And for those reasons, the Council voted unanimously for those present uh, to oppose. Mr. Chair and members, Rand Martin here on behalf of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in opposition to the bill. Thank you. Brian Augusta on behalf of the California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation, and we remain opposed unless amended. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Paul Gonzalez, representing 20 cities throughout the state, all opposed. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Jason Ryan, League California Cities, we are also in opposition to this bill. Sandy George, representing the American Planning Association, also in uh, opposition. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Kira Ross on behalf of the cities of Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, San Marcos, and the Marin County Council of Mayors and Council Members, all in opposition. Good afternoon. Kirk Blackburn on behalf of the cities of La Cunada, Flint Ridge, and El Cajon in opposition. Jeff Kiernan on behalf of the 86 cities of the League of California Cities, Los Angeles County Division, in opposition. Chris Lee on behalf of the California State Association of Counties, in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt Robinson with Shaw Yoder Antwi on behalf of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and the San Mateo City County Association of Governments, unfortunately opposed at this time. Aaron Gilbert for the City of Encinitas in opposition. Julian Voris with the Urban Counties of California, also on behalf of the Rural Counties of, of California in opposition. Thank you. Marina Wyant with the California Housing Consortium with opposed unless amended position. Tyrone Buckley, Housing California. We also have a opposed unless amended position. Fernando Marti with the San Francisco Council of Community Housing Organizations. We also oppose the bill. Matt Broad on behalf of Unite here in opposition. Thank you. Tim Frank on behalf of both the Center for Sustainable Neighborhoods and the Sierra Business Council. Opposed unless amended. Maxine Mantel on behalf of the City of West Hollywood, opposed unless amended. Again, Fujioka Board of Tenants Together, a coalition of 50 tenant organizations statewide, oppose. Also, Chinatown Community Development Center, oppose. And to clarify, Asian Americans for Advancing Justice in California, uh, it was incorrectly indicated as a support. It is opposed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Lewis Brown Jr. on behalf of PolicyLink. We're a racial equity organization based in Oakland. We're opposed unless amended. Eric Arriaga on behalf of the City of Salinas in opposition. Jesse Brooks, I'm from Oakland, California. I'm a private citizen, also a community activist. I oppose the... 
Kerry White, San Francisco business owner, opposed to the bill. Jill Stewart, executive director of the Coalition to Preserve LA, 9,000 renters, homeowners, poor, middle class, 100% oppose. Yeah. Ann Kalachidis, SV Mobile Homeowners, oppose. Teresa Flandrick, San Francisco, Senior and Disability Action, very opposed. Tony Robles, Senior and Disability Action, San Francisco, and also Manila Town Heritage Foundation, opposed. Mary McNamara, Sunset District for Sensible Planning, a huge area in San Francisco, be profoundly and negatively impacted by this bill, 100% opposed. Katherine Howard, on behalf of SF Ocean Edge, Stand Up for San Francisco, Speak, Sunset Parkside Education Action Committee, Save Ocean Beach, and Friends of Sutro Heights, totally opposed. Good afternoon, Kyle Jones with Sierra Club California in opposition today, thank you. Good afternoon, Norma Garcia, Mission Economic Development Agency. We are a nonprofit affordable housing developer in San Francisco, opposed. John Galt, representing the Rebel Alliance, opposes 827. Dana Dilworth, uh, founder of Brisbane Baylands Community Advisory Group. Um, I and a number of citizens of Brisbane are opposed to the uh, measure. Thank you. John Bechtel from Sonoma County, unequivocally opposed. Dennis Richard speaking as an individual planning commissioner in San Francisco where we have 60,000 units we've entitled and have yet to be built. Opposed. Lori Brooks, San Francisco, president of the Cal Hollow Association representing approximately 1,800 residents and we oppose. <coughs> Layla Stanley representing 1,900 members of the San Francisco Tenants Union. We're opposed. Susan Kirsch, representing Livable California with about 40 organizations and 6,000 people, were opposed. Andy Gillis, Occupy San Francisco, vehemently opposed to this ill-conceived gift to developers. Uh, ben Terrell, I work with the Redstone Labor Temple Association, which includes 25 nonprofit and community groups. We're all opposed to this bill. Rick Hall, San Francisco, uh, both uh, the mission area and uh, Equity First and Cultural Action Network, all our members are opposed. Julie Testa with Livable California, resident of Pleasanton, California, opposed. David Bancroft, 50-year resident of San Francisco, strongly opposed. Nancy Allen, resident of Pleasanton and planning commissioner in Pleasanton, opposed. Hi, I'm Michelle Parasat with Public Advocates, uh, here to oppose along with the North Bay Organizing Project, Genesis, the Affordable Housing Network of Santa Clara, Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco, Mountain View Tenants Coalition, Fair Rents for Redwood City, Public Council, ACT LA, ACE, Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, Beyond the Arc, a Jewish Partnership for Justice, California Reinvestment Coalition, Central American Resource Center, Cali or, uh, Coalition for Economic Survival, Community Development Technologies, Community Health Councils, the East Los Angeles Community Corporation, Esperanza Community Housing Corporation, Inner City Struggle, United Tenants, Investing in Place, Jobs to Move America, and about 30 other organizations uh, that I won't bother to take up more time to read. Well, you Thank can, you. You can submit the names of the groups if you would like. Richard Harmon on behalf of the cities of Merced, Hayward, Palo Alto, Pismo Beach, and Esperia, all in opposition. Alex Gibbs here today on behalf of the tri Valley cities of San Ramon, Livermore, Danville, Dublin, and Pleasanton. Uh, unfortunately, opposed unless amended, but we would like to thank the author and his staff uh, for being so great to work with so far on this issue. Andrew Medino of Asian Americans Advancing Justice California in opposition. Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation here in opposition. Mr. Chair and members, Dominic Damari here on behalf of the cities of Napa and Long Beach, both in opposition. Eric Frame, 
advocate uh, for homeless residents in Sacramento. I'm afraid a uh, collusion between big developers and All state right, sir, and you comments. will only sir. increase the gentrification and homelessness in this state. Thank you. No comments, please. Just uh, Robert Coburn, uh, part of Sacramento Tenants Union, oppose this bill. It's a bad bill. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Michael Barnes, Albany City Council, speaking for myself, opposed. Mickey Jackson, VDK Coalition, Northeast LA, opposed. Jorge Castaneda, Coalition to Preserve LA, Committee to Defend Roosevelt, Los Angeles Tennis Union on the east side, strongly oppose. Grace Yu from Koreatown in Los Angeles. United Neighborhoods for Los Angeles strongly opposes. So does the Environmental Justice Collaborative and uh, a whole slew of residents that I will not mention. Okay. My name is Robert Farrell. I'm a former member of the Los Angeles City Council. The Black Community Clergy Labor Alliance is opposed. And Senator, we had one request. Would you please meet with us in South LA before you made this decision? Our goal in coming here was to ask okay. the committee to please not discuss this until at least you met with us. All right. You have not met with us or the NAACP and all okay. the rest of that. And for that, Excuse you me. should be ashamed. Okay. Okay. Mary Eliza, Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods, we oppose. Thank you. Damian Goodman, Executive Director of the Crenshaw Subway Coalition. Director of Housing as a Human Rights, a project of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Senators, we implore you, kill this bill. Hey. Okay. Okay, let's stop that outburst, sir. Let's stop let's stop that outburst. Sir, let's stop that outburst. Come on. Come on, we're not doing that here. Senator is presenting his bill. He has a right to do that. Um, okay. Other uh, is there anybody else that um, would like to uh, testify? If not, uh, questions of the author. Perhaps Senator Weiner can respond to some of the concerns. Senator Gaines has something he'd like to Okay. Uh, we got questions to the author. Who wants to, uh, Senator Roth? Senator Gaines? You have a question? No? Okay. Senator Roth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, it's not a question of the author. I, I just feel like I'm compelled to make a statement. So if you're is your uh, I think it is, but maybe I need to maybe I need to get into it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I feel All right, yeah. maybe they need to turn me up. Um, I just want to I just want to commend the author um, uh, for his courage, his smarts on this particular issue, what he's done uh, last year for to advance the the cause of housing, what he's attempting to do now, and and actually for his uh, stamina, uh, having stood up there now, having been there myself on other issues, it um, it pains me a bit to to have to refrain from supporting the measure today. And I mean that because I know, um, and I think I know, I'm certainly beginning to understand the impact of difficult and in some cases misguided uh, local policies on the availability of housing, um, certainly in the coastal highly ur urbanized areas of San Francisco and, and parts of Los Angeles, maybe not South LA. Um, I have to say, having listened to some of the comments, my challenge, frankly, is not um, the issue of local control or the local control argument. Uh, while I try to be sensitive to that because I certainly am privileged to represent an area with seven cities and those cities have local control prerogatives um, in this housing area and other issues that are of importance to them. But frankly, when local control results in uh, intransigence on important public policy issues, I believe that needs to be addressed. 
uh, and addressed quickly, addressed promptly, addressed efficiently, and, and addressed effectively. Uh, I have to say that my challenge is not the um, lack of sufficient inclusionary housing that my friends at the table referenced, um, although that's certainly important and we also need to deal with the displacement issue that others have referenced. That's obviously critical. We're dealing um, with people's lives. But at some point we need more housing in this state and whether that housing is market rate or affordable and frankly I think it needs to be both. I think we need to recognize that as, as uh, legislators in, under the dome here. But my challenge, frankly, is the one-size-fits-all approach to the bill, which may be the way you need to do legislation on this issue and certainly do it that way in this state. But it, it creates difficulties for me when it's a, a one-size-fits-all approach from north to south, from coastal uh, to inland, because it doesn't necessarily work in some of the rural areas that I'm, I'm privileged to represent. But having made that speech, Senator, I commit to work with you to try to fix this problem and fix it quickly um, soon. And I intend to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dodd. Yes. Um, you know, I think we've heard the problem today. And this is a problem. I don't care if you're from Southern California or Northern California. This is a problem that is not going to go away uh, by inaction. And I, too, applaud uh, the bill's author here for uh, stepping up uh, with a policy. Uh, cities and counties have continually asked the state of California to provide more funding for affordable housing, uh, Senator Bell has his SB3. We had Senator Atkins with her bill last year. We stepped up on about, you know, at least a half a dozen or more housing bills here. And then, of course, we're asked to invest in public transportation, going through neighborhoods, going through downtowns. And the idea that we're going to continue <coughs> to invest these kind of hundreds of millions of dollars without seeing a corresponding uh, uh, increase in density and housing in these areas, you know, frankly, we're never going to hit the goals that we have in the state of California if we don't do something bold like this. You know, um, I served on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission for 14 years, the last four years with, I think, four years with uh, Senator Weiner and also Senator Bell and others. And we did have a policy uh, 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 resolution 3434, which was a regional TOD policy that has worked actually very, very well in the Bay Area. Uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, the, the situation, it, it takes the whole corridor into account and not just bus stops and rail stops. I can see why it's different, but uh, I think that um, uh, I, I think that his ideas here are should not just be all tossed out. Unfortunately, I won't be supporting this bill today because I too have 22 cities all under 100,000 population that have been, uh, you know, it, it actually boards of supervisors have come out actually in support of the bill. I've had three of them, but almost every single mayor, city council member is opposing the bill because it doesn't give them the flexibility they need. So instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, lousy analogy I know, um, I think that we ought to take the policies that uh, Senator Weiner has come up with here and continue working on this to devise a plan that helps with a lot of the concerns that we've had today, but doesn't stop here. This is one of the concerns that I have is uh, you know, we have so much need for this in the state of California, and uh, I, I appreciate the displacement arguments, uh, but... We are never, in the state of California, going to have a perfect solution. In some way, somehow, um, I think a lot of these policies that are in this bill should be, uh, you know, continued. And I, I uh, got the assurance of the committee chair, Senator Bell, that he's interested in working on this policy going forward. Thank you. Yes, that's true. And uh, Senator uh, Skinner and Senator McGuire. Senator Skinner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, apologies, I 
was in present for the entire uh, comments from uh, witnesses or the public, though certainly as a co-author of the bill, I've uh, received many, many communications on the bill. Um, and I'm sure they reflect much of what was discussed. But let me tell you why I still support this bill. And while I appreciate the reactions of the one-size-fits-all, it has been modified a great deal, so it is no longer one-size-fits-all, though I do appreciate that um, those jurisdictions that don't want to have, uh, you know, that don't want to have the state uh, involved in their zoning process are quite resistant. But let me say why we need to. If we look at so many of the problems that we are trying to adjust and fix here in the state capital that plague our state, let's look at the rise of poverty. Why is, do we have so many more people in poverty? It's partly due to low wage jobs, change in employment sector, yes, but it's also due to the cost of living. What's one of the single largest portions of that cost of living increase? The cost of housing. Why? Because we have not built enough. So we have created, to a degree, some level of our increase in poverty due to housing policies. Secondarily, when we look at all of the work that we are trying to do to address air pollution, where does air pollution come from? Primarily fossil fuel vehicles. Why do we have so many vehicle miles having to be traveled in our state? Because of land use policies because our housing is so far away from our employment sectors. And of course, lower income Californians, lower wage workers have to be even farther from their job centers because of the lack of housing and the cost of housing. Additionally, I, uh, I'll tell a story from my days on the Berkeley City Council, but before that, I totally appreciate that many people feel that a flaw in the bill is that it does not have enough mandates regarding very affordable housing because we have such a shortage of affordable housing and because housing costs so much. But if we do not build more housing, we will never get the cost of housing down because of our supply crisis. But not only that, we, when we look at why, uh, my two years interim, I was teaching at both UC Berkeley and UC Davis. At UC Berkeley, I was at the Goldman School of Public Policy, and I was teaching about appropriate state interventions to address poverty. One of my speakers was Richard Rothstein. Richard Rothstein is the author of the book, The Color of Law. I recommend that everyone read that book. It is eye-opening. The New York Times, this last Sunday, did a two-column, full-page editorial on much of the subject matter that Rothstein covers in The Color of Law. And it, what it is about how our housing policies, whether we fully understood it or not, have been directly racist and economically discriminatory. And that the lack of the rules first that prevented African American home ownership initially created diswealth generationally, and that since then the recession, the mortgage crisis targeted African Americans almost uh, very particularly, and now home ownership among black Americans is at its lowest level since pre the elimination of the uh, fair housing, in other words, since the passage of the fair housing laws. And additionally, both Rothstein's book and the New York Times editorial talks about how zoning policies were initially developed for the purpose of economically exclusive zoning. So part of what this bill is doing, even though it, if it's not been directly talked about, is unraveling some of those policies that some, do, some were done intentionally, some with misunderstanding, that have created economic zones in our communities and kept many people from gaining wealth and kept other people 
in, in, uh, ex out of housing opportunity. So that's another reason I support the bill. Now finally I want to address another issue around the cries for, well if this bill just had more affordability in it or dealt with providing low income housing more, X or Y community might support it. When I was in the Berkeley City Council in the 1980s, that we, we accepted gladly the last HUD financing for scattered site, fully subsidized public housing. And we were so excited because by accepting that grant, we were going to be allowing housing that was not like ghetto housing, meaning we weren't going to build 20-story, uh, um, you know, one big uh, uh, Section 8 type of unit, but instead we were going to pick 12 locations in the city of Berkeley with 8 to 12 units each, spreading it around, giving people lots of opportunity, and not impacting any one neighborhood too much. Now, you might say, boy, were you all naive. But the entire, what happened? By picking 12 sites throughout the city of Berkeley, the entire community went against it. And we succeeded, and we built that housing, but then the community, in effect, did a veiled recall. They went and created district elections, which they said because they wanted more local control. What was that about in a city of Berkeley? Because they didn't want poor people living next to them, even in a community like Berkeley. Now that housing still exists, and if you drove through Berkeley right now, you probably wouldn't even recognize it, because it was done very well. And I think that the housing that would be built under uh, SB 827 would be done very well. And it did, in uh, Senator Weiner's bill, require a certain amount of affordable units. But I bring it up because very many times when we hear communities talk about, I don't want to have a change in zoning, or we don't want this density, or, or we, you know, we'll support housing, but somewhere else, there is never somewhere else. And so, while well, I would, uh, yes, certainly there could be modifications and improvements to the bill, and if the bill isn't successful this year, there will be lots of people who work on trying to bring it to a place where more of us can support, but I think it's a very important thing we have to confront, how our housing policies have contributed to poverty, have affected and hurt our minority communities, and of course are creating much of our air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I didn't know Senator Weiner that well prior to uh, working here in the Senate. And I am so happy that I've been able to get to know him. He is one of the hardest working. He is tenacious. At times, stubborn, which I greatly respect. Uh, and he is also uh, one of the most dedicated here in the legislature when it comes to the issue of housing. He sticks his neck out. And if you are a uh, resident of San Francisco or the peninsula, you should be proud to have Scott Weiner as your representative. And I do believe it's been deeply unfortunate about how personal this has become on this issue, on the personal attacks. I also understand that this is also very personal to many in this room throughout the state, and um, passion is high. That said, I want to be able to stick to the issue on this. I've had the pleasure to be able to meet with Senator Weiner and the chair of this committee uh, for the greater part of three or four months uh, working on this bill. Uh, and the reason why I've been meeting with Senator Weiner and uh, the good senator from San Jose is because this bill goes to two different committees. Of course, this committee, as well as governance and finances, focus on all issues of local government, as well as financial decisions and impact local government. And while we may not have always agreed uh, in our discussions, uh, it has been an important conversation to have. Uh, and as I said uh, as late as this afternoon to Senator Weiner, whatever the outcome is on today's vote, absolutely committed to be able to work with them uh, in the weeks, months, and years to come. There are some concerns that uh, Senator Weiner is very familiar with, Senator Bell is very familiar with, but just want to lay it out here. Uh,
from the beginning, I have been concerned that this has been more focused uh, as a market rate housing bill. Um, and it may come as a surprise to some uh, from the area that I represent, but if you take a look at my background, I've been very focused on the issue of affordable housing. And I do believe, because there are dozens of cities in this state that do not have inclusionary housing ordinances, there needs to be a dedicated percentage of affordable housing in this bill. Bottom line. Uh, if we are focused on being able to provide very low, low, and moderate housing, we have to make sure that there is a guaranteed percentage for working families in the state. And I do not believe that the affordable provisions currently in this bill are strong enough. Um, and uh, we can't just base off of a clue sharing. I won't uh, belabor the point. I also have deep concerns in regards to the protections for displacing current affordable housing units. I do believe that uh, we need stronger language for anti-displacement protections for those who are living in affordable homes and units across the state. And I do believe that we need to be able to apply the SB 35 language, which offers a 10-year protection. Uh, and that is why I want to continue to work uh, on this bill. Still have some concerns on the issues of bus stops as well. Um, I, I'm going to go back to the issue, though, of protections. There have been amendments that he has taken. Again, I think we need to be able to go stronger, but again, the good senator from San Francisco is very well aware, and again, I'm not going to belabor the point. It's been bantied about about one-size-fits-all approaches for uh, cities. I represent a very, uh, one of the, I'd say, I have to say the best area of California, and it's incredibly diverse. You have the wealthiest county in the state of California uh, in the second Senate district, and you also have the poorest county in the state of California. And one-size-fits-all approaches do not work for the North Coast. They just don't. Um, and talk about the issue of density. If you live in a community of over a million or in the hundreds of thousands, density works because you have that built-in transit. I believe that we should be building denser along rail. I believe that we should be building denser along ferries. Bus stops, I have great concerns with. And I also have concerns with if you live in a community of 12,000 or you live in a community of 40,000, what works in San Francisco does not work in those communities. And it's not because they are uh, anti-affordable housing. They simply don't work. In the community that I live in, our fire truck, our largest fire truck, goes up to three stories. That's our ladder truck. There's practical issues in these smaller communities. And that is a real issue. In the community that I live in, when I was on the city council, city of Hillsburg, we built some of the most, uh, per capita, most affordable housing in the county of Sonoma at the time. And that's why I think we need to continue to work on this issue. I also have some concerns in regards to CEQA. This, this, this prevents cities and counties from analyzing um, any of the potential impacts. And I think that we can strengthen that area as well. Senator Weiner has made adjustments, and I appreciate this, in regards to planning for local cities and counties. Uh, gone to uh, two years plus a third year uh, that would have to be approved by HCD. When it comes to general plans, uh, general plans are planning for water and wastewater allocations uh, years out. It is we have to allow cities and counties uh, a practical timeline to be able to plan for a denser uh, community. And I'm not against having uh, in the right uh, size communities denser projects, but we have to allow them to plan for it. And finally, I think on the issue of parking, again, Senator Weiner has made some amendments that has gone further than where the original bill was at. Uh, I think the one area that I would say, if you live in a community uh, of Santa Rosa, um, I have some challenges of you're going to need some potential parking because transit, candidly, is not as robust as in a city of San Francisco. So that's also some areas where I would like to be able to continue to work. Here's my bottom line. Uh, and I've said this to Senator Weiner, I've said this to 
uh, Senator Bell, and I also want to say thank you to Senator Bell as well, as he has been working uh, overtime on this issue. And uh, he really has been, no, it's true, and you have been such a champion for all issues of housing as well. But uh, I'm committed to be able to work, regardless of today's vote, uh, over the next six months, um, if today's vote is not successful, to be able to make a bill that is successful. Because uh, I do think we have a housing crisis in this state, but we also have to get it right. Thank you. And uh, unfortunately, not going to be supporting the bill today. I've been very clear with the senator all along, but I, uh, again, want to say thank you to my uh, friend, uh, Scott Weiner, for all of his hard work. Well, I want to echo uh, Senator McGuire's comments about uh, a number of things. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who came up here, um, especially the folks who made the trek up from Southern California. I know it's a long way, and I uh, appreciate you taking the opportunity to, to, to make your voices heard. Um, you know, I've always, it's always a little, um, we always get a lot of fantastic, great voices from Northern California. It's just easier to get here, and I, I, uh, I know how challenging it is for folks from Southern California, so I appreciate that. Um, I also want to just echo Senator McGuire's sentiments with regards to the author. I think that um, Senator Weiner has been graceful. He's been uh, really responsive in trying to address a whole slew of issues. And I think he's you know, ultimately very passionate about what is a, a, serious, a serious issue that we face infrastructurally. And that's housing affordability, availability, access. Um, and you know, I, I think that regardless of, I don't know what's going to happen today, but um, Scott's certainly not going away. This issue's not going away. And one of the things that I've been messaging to the many cities and neighborhood folks who have come to me from my own district uh, raising concerns about the bill is, okay, well, if we're not going to support this, you know, what are some, uh, some, some ways of, of addressing the issue and, um, and doing so in a way that's more community friendly? Because you know, hiding your head in the sand and, and just opposing these kinds of things um, in, in the future will not, will not um, fly. We've got to come up with some ways that will be respectful of local needs and, and the geographic diversity of the state while also addressing the broader infrastructural challenges that Scott is attempting to address here. Now, let me just start by saying that I, I, I want to just raise a couple of concerns. I mean, what, you know, um, I, I do think that one of the problems with the bill conceptually for me and there was a great uh, article, uh, an interview with uh, Michael Storper, who's a professor at UCLA uh, in the planning, in the uh, Luskin School. Um, he's an economic geographer. And he talks about how uh, this bill, in some respects, talks about is, is linear. The, the density of the US ought to be linear. So the idea is that we have, we, we authorize uh, density along a corridor. And you know, I think the image of, L when he says actually this image of LA is one of densifying our thoroughfares and leaving our other neighborhoods with low density. And he says, personally, I don't think that's good urbanism, nor is it economically or spatially efficient. Um, and his argument is that the benef ben benefits of density come from density clusters, not from density corridors. Stringing density out is a terrible idea. This is his quote from the standpoints of design, placemaking, sociability, and aesthetics. What we need is something more like a forest. This is his, his argument. Um, so, so one of the questions is, uh, is you know, how, how do we, how do we um, you know, is, is the bill too, too focused on corridors? And in a place like Los Angeles, you end up with these in difficult challenges, right? Because you've got buses that are lined on a grid system that are essentially, you know, they guarantee that huge sections, huge portions of LA's basin would be subject to the formula here. And amendments to the bill attempting to capture only those bus lines that are more appropriate for upzoning have just made things, um, I think, a little bit more confusing. Uh, the other issue, of course, is that bus routes are not necessarily well-worn or fixed. I mean, LA Metro actually changes its schedule frequently. And I just, I, I, as someone who is a passionate supporter of public transit, who worked very closely with, with Senator Weiner to get public transit financing into a number of various budget plays, including SB1, uh, you know, I'm concerned about how political those scheduling changes might become under this bill. I mean, there's literally no metropolitan area in the country that doles out development rights based on the frequency of a local bus schedule. And um, I, uh, you know, and I, and I, I, I worry about this. Um, Denny Zane, who you and I know well, you know, runs Move LA, I think he was concerned, you know, that the Measure M might have had problems passing in Los Angeles if folks knew that there were such 
uh, kind of local zoning implications associated with the construction and transit. By the way, this is super complicated. I mean, I got a chance to visit a couple sites. You, you correctly point out that the state and our local communities have put a lot of infrastructure investment into rail transit. Let's, let's, put, let's even put aside the buses. But even the rail transit locations have become complicated. There were cases, I, I, I just got a chance to tour uh, the expo line recently uh, on this issue. Um, you know, there are issues of stations that were situated in particular places that were residential areas, uh, not, you know, because, wh wh where the residences never would have, uh, uh, w would have fought tooth and nail the location of a, a, a bus, uh, sorry, a, a, a train station in their neighborhood if they'd known that it would have come along with the implications of A27. The reason why they put the station there was because it had to do with integration with certain bus routes. Uh, uh, so it didn't really have to do with the, 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 the particular zoning or density around that particular station, but it had to do with the way that it fit into the broader bus system in the region. Um, so, you know, I, so th those are some um, concerns. I also worry that, um, you know, if you think about it, uh, there's a tension between what we allow the market to build to meet demand and what we require from it in return. And, uh, you know, find, and we've heard about concerns about developers, I, you know, I think that finding the right price to charge the developer isn't easy, but that's what inclusionary zoning and density bonus law is premised upon. Um, you know, there was a, a local government staffer who, who talked about how local government is in the business of selling land use rights. And, you know, perhaps 827 is, you know, um, is, is, is suddenly giving away this, this, this enormously valuable series of rights. Now, doing so for good reasons, but um, I do think it's at the heart of why a lot of the affordable housing folks are largely in support of the bill. I mean, one, you know, the, there have been some really important negotiations that have happened between local government and developers to get affordable housing um, and make sure that there are enough guarantees and set-asides. Uh, but, but density for density's sake does not necessarily lead to affordability. I mean, all one has to do is look at Manhattan where nobody can, you know, fit into, I mean, everyone's living in a closet and paying $5,000 a month to live in a closet. Um, so, so that, that's kind of, that's, that's another, uh, I guess, a concern that, that, you know, are we making sure that we're capturing the value here of what we're potentially giving away? Uh, there's another concern about historical preservation and demolition prohibitions in LA. Um, there's no language exempting historical preservation zones from the, the bill. I know that uh, folks from the author staff say that's not necessary. They say the local governments can complete, you know, can completely protect these areas through ordinances, restrictions on demolition permits. Um, but there is certainly dispute. You know, we've had a we had a similar problem with this in my district, um, where in Santa Monica, for example, when after Costa Hawkins was passed, um, you know, uh, the city of Santa Monica passed historical preservation rules, and they got beat up for it in the courts. So even placing that aside, the reality is that LA has a dangerously weak demolition ordinance now, and you can only you know you can preserve only one wall of a structure and tear down the rest under a construction permit today. So at least in my district, um, historic preservation zones I think need an explicit carve out to stand a chance of surviving. So a couple of things to think about. Um, I, I think that uh, first of all, you know, one of my questions is. I loved your approach in SB 35. I was a co-author, and it was a controversial bill. I supported it before it got watered down. Um, you know, I think that ultimately what you were doing with SB 35 is saying, look, cities have to meet certain goals. If they don't meet them, then these rules will kick into place. And one of the questions is, how do we put in place a scheme that says, okay, cities, we're going to hold you, to the, we're going to hold your feet to the fire, but we're going to allow you to come up with a series. Uh, and, and by the way, maybe this ought to be done at a region level as opposed to a city level. I don't know. Uh, but, but, but we can say to cities, okay, we're going to hold your feet to the fire, but we're going to allow you to find a path that meets your local needs, your local geography, your local neighborhood uh, challenges. The other thing I'll say is on the CEQA issue, I mean, this is an enormous CEQA reform, um, but, we've got, but, but we've got all sorts of cases of projects that, that the cities themselves want to have on board, and yet, because of lawsuits and, and all sorts of crazy battles, litigation, et cetera, those projects can't get online. And I wonder whether you know, we ought to be starting by fixing those kinds of situations um, before you know, taking so, so, so aggressive an approach. Uh, so those are some of the things I'm thinking about. Um, I, I really, you know, I mean it when I say that I appreciate uh, what, the, what the senator has done. Because I've got to say, you know, 
but he has raised the profile of this issue profoundly. And I think there was a sense out there that there was nothing we could do about this issue, that it, you know, these problems were always going to exist, and that the state wasn't ever going to take them seriously. Well, the state is starting to take this issue seriously, because um, even if folks, those, those folks who aren't planning on voting for this bill today uh, are, are, are not satisfied with the status quo. And the question now becomes, you know, uh, how, do we, how do we work together to come up with a series of solutions that are going to be respectful of the diversity of the state, while also uh, understanding and responsive to this enormous infrastructural and equity gap that exists. And so that's the challenge that we all have today. But I, I certainly want to send a message to the opponents of this bill that if this bill fails today or if it fails at a later stage in the legislature, uh, you know, th this issue is not going away. And so the question and the challenge I pose to all of you is how do we address these availability challenges that are at the heart of what Senator Weiner is trying to work on in a way that address the core needs and concerns that you have brought to the table in this discussion? Senator Ted Gaines. Yeah, great. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to your bill, Senator Weiner. And um, I want to thank you for bringing this forward and displaying the courage that you have. I support your bill. I'll support it today. I've been in the legislature for 12 years, and I haven't seen any action on CEQA. And Senator Michael Rubio tried to bring that legislation forward for reform, and absolutely nothing has happened. And barring CEQA reform, I think your pathway is the pathway for the construction of additional housing in the state of California. We have a housing crisis in California. You're, you're providing the opportunity for three million additional units in California, and I appreciate that. Not just apartments. These are opportunities for condominiums and townhomes. When we take a look at the American dream, the ability to satisfy the American dream here in California is harder than it's ever been before. And we actually have a migration of people moving out of the Bay Area, out of Silicon Valley, out of San Francisco, and they're going to other tech hubs across the country. And if we don't solve this problem, we're going to lose our tax base and the economic vitality of the state of California. Um, we, th this would be a huge job creator. The, the, the opportunity to add additional housing. Yes, we have a labor problem with housing and with other areas here in this economy. But the fact that if your bill moved forward, we'd create the opportunity where the market would stabilize and labor, there'd be labor demand to make sure that those units are being built. So it's good for the economy, it's good for job creation, it's good for remaining competitive when it comes to technology. When I take a look at what's happening in China, and the fact and how quickly that they are catching up to what we have here in California, in Silicon Valley. Half of venture capital money is now going to China, where 10 years ago it was about 5 or 6 percent. Uh, we have some real challenges in front of us. So um, I will continue to work with your bill if it doesn't get out of this committee today, um, and hopefully be able to support it. I have to see what the fashion would be if it doesn't get out of committee now. Uh, but I am supportive of your efforts. So thank you. Senator Weiner, if he has any uh, comments based on his colleagues' uh, discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the chair and also Senator McGuire uh, for, uh, you know, you have spent a significant amount of time with me and also with Senator Skinner uh, trying to work through issues, and although um, we weren't able to come to a uh, complete resolution, we actually did make a fair amount of progress, and there was uh, more common ground, frankly, than I had anticipated uh, going in. And so I do appreciate both chairs' um, focus on the bill and trying to uh, see if there was a, a path. Uh, and of course, if there is not a path this year, there will be a path in the future. As uh, I don't remember which of my colleagues said it, maybe it was Senator Dodd, um, that this problem is not going away. Uh, that 3.6 million home deficit uh, it grows by 100,000 every year because we're supposed to be producing 180,000 units of housing per year. And in reality, we are producing 80,000. 
So it goes up by 100,000 every year, and it continues to do that. And so, you know, I feel like sometimes in government, at all levels, when it comes to housing, it's a little bit like fiddling while Rome burns. We gnash our teeth, we wring our hands, every, we, everyone identifies the problems, the problems with building housing. There's a million problems with building housing. And that's, that's the heart of it in California. We identify all of the bad things about building housing without acknowledging the good things, that housing is foundational. Other than air and water, housing is pretty much foundational to everything else in life. And when you, you know, you have to, got to tie it all together. When you look at the explosion of homelessness, not just in San Francisco or Berkeley or Santa Monica, but all across this state, because we are pushing poor people onto the street. The number of San Francisco Unified has 2,200 homeless students. One of our schools just opened up their auditorium so that families in that school who are homeless could live there. They had an, enough homeless families to fill an auditorium. And this is happening around the state. We are seeing young families who, God forbid, they have that second kid. And guess what? They're gone. Because we have made sure, through bad public policy, that there is nowhere for them to live. People who are terrified that their apartment building is getting painted, because guess what that means? That might mean that the building is getting sold and they're going to get evicted. And they know that if they get evicted, that there is nowhere for them to go because we refuse to take the hard steps necessary to build more housing. So this issue isn't going away. Um, this bill isn't going away. Whatever happens today, we're going to keep working. Um, I do want to just respond to a few issues um, that were raised. Um, uh, you know, with all respect to the Western Center, uh, to suggest that this bill largely applies to low-income communities is factually inaccurate. When you look at the list of cities that are not just opposing this bill, but vehemently opposing this bill. The most passionate thing we heard today was from the mayor or former mayor of Beverly Hills, Marin County. Wealthy communities throughout this state who are vehemently opposing this bill because they know that there is going to be more housing in their community, whether it is uh, Orinda or whether it is Santa Rosa or whether it is Beverly Hills or any of the other wealthier communities that are opposing this bill. Uh, this bill affects the west side of San Francisco and the north side of San Francisco, some of the wealthiest areas in San Francisco where I have some constituents who are really mad at me right now because they're going to have, under this bill, some apartment buildings in their community. This bill applies to a broad swath of California. Um, I also, you know, I, last year we worked really hard with labor on SB 35. I am thrilled that, the, that Mr. Diaz now praises SB 35. It's great. It's a pro-labor bill. It's a pro-housing bill. Labor opposed that bill at the beginning. And we worked very hard and we were able to pass a good bill that is creating good union jobs. Uh, on Wednesday, Labor sent a letter saying that, uh, that they're confident that they can reach an agreement on the bill. We've already made amendments to address some of Labor's concerns. And this bill says, we believe we can reach an agreement on this bill. So I'm surprised to have Labor come here today and say vote against the bill. We want an opportunity to continue to work with Labor and others uh, on the bill. Uh, this is not a one-size-fits-all bill. With all respect to my colleagues, uh, that phrase has been used a lot on this bill. It is not one-size-fits-all. As I said at the beginning, it doesn't change the approval process. The local planning commission or city council will still have the same exact role under CEQA conditional use. It doesn't change local design standards. Every city can adopt its own design standards. Doesn't change local demolition controls. Doesn't change local inclusion area. Every city, they, they want to do 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, cities will be able to make that choice. It doesn't change local impact fees. Doesn't change whether a parcel is zoned residential. This is not a one size fits all approach. Any more than any bill that this legislature passes in any area is one size fits all. We make policy for the whole state of California on housing, 
the housing element, on education, on health care, on a million issues. And yes, it's for the whole state. And that means I guess everything we do is one size fits all. This maintains significant local flexibility. The city of Los Angeles can ban demolitions in HPOZs. They have that within their power. And this bill does not take that away. Uh, so colleagues, I very much appreciate the thoughtful conversation. I've had individual, very thoughtful conversations with all of you. You are all amazing. Uh, and I really uh, am honored to have you as my colleagues. Uh, and I respectfully ask for your I vote. I think uh, Senator Galjani, did you want to make a comment? Go right yes. um, ahead. I'll say a few words after. Senator, you've been incredibly patient because I've I've really really struggled with this bill. You know, I represent an area where we have the opposite problem, and and you and I have discussed this. In my district, you can have a four bedroom, two bath house for fifteen hundred a month to rent, and you can purchase it for three hundred thousand dollars or less. Um, we were ground zero for the housing crisis. We still have foreclosures in the area that I represent and the district that I had before. The problem that we have is that we don't have the job centers. We're housing rich, we're jobs poor. So I've, I've really struggled to wrap my head around this bill and approach it not from a district perspective from my district, because it won't have that great of an impact on my district, even though it would affect my district. I've tried to really approach it from your perspective and Senator Bell's perspective and the, and the members who represent areas that are really saddled with this problem of being jobs rich and housing poor. And I've, real, I've realized that I have a great deal to learn because there are, are subjects that have come up under your bill that we haven't talked about so much because we don't have those problems where I'm at. But one of the things that I'm, I'm struggling with this is that um, you're correct that we haven't had a tremendous policy discussion that's very broad in the legislature. You know, I got here and I was in office for three months and we started having the housing crisis in 2007. And then it was followed by the budget crisis. And my colleagues who served with me in this, the assembly will remember that we have been triaging crisis since we got here. Um, the economy started to get a little better. We had the water crisis. You know, there is a community in my district, Mountain House, that um, didn't have adequate water supply planned for that area. And as a result, when we had the water shortage and the governor did an administrative ruling that there were going to be reductions by all of the different irrigation districts, Byron Bethany had to cut off supply to Mountain House. And, and for a while, they were worried that they would have no water because it wasn't planned for there. Different things that we have. Um, we, the legislature wasn't as focused on housing because of the glut that we had and because of the crisis. It is time for us to have this whole discussion. This is one incredibly important piece, but I don't, I don't think it's the only piece. And I think that it should be discussed also along with going back to the discussion that we had pre-housing crisis when Senator Torlakson was here. And he had legislation that gave incentives for housing projects to go to, to jobs rich areas and for incentives for companies to expand in jobs poor housing rich areas. We don't talk about those things anymore, and I believe that it's important that we do. We've had, I authored High Speed Rail because we were trying to bring transit to the jobs rich areas and the housing rich areas and, and, and have all that, and we've made commitments in that area. We don't know what the impacts of that. You and I have discussed a ballot measure that's going to be on the ballot in June or November, and it has to do with um, tax incentives allowing mobility of current taxes for those who live and want to downsize or, or move to a different area. We unfortunately don't have the benefit of knowing what kind of an impact that will have on this whole space. 
could it be that there will be people who are no longer working that are living in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley who would like to move to an area like where I represent where they can live on a lake or a golf course for $400,000? Maybe so, we don't know. And, and I wish that we could have the benefit of that conversation. But all of these pieces, um, what you're trying to focus on and address that gives us a, a, a shorter term um, fix to the to the problem also needs to be accompanied with a longer term vision for you know how do we get back to making sure that we have a jobs housing balance so that we don't find ourselves in the same situation five five or ten years from now and and I struggle because I, I want to have that conversation together I was very proud to support Senator Bell's transportation package this last year and if you would have asked me two years ago, I wasn't there yet. But we had a lot of time to have a lot of conversation about it and look at many, many pieces. And so that's where I'm at. I want to get there, but I want to have this conversation in, in the same context of, of keeping the jobs housing balance, too. So I'm not, I'm not ready to support it today. Um, I want to keep continuing to have the conversation, but this is not this isn't the only solution. We need to look at a broader a broader vision going forward. Uh, just uh, I don't want to say too many things, but uh, um, because Senator Weiner and I are in a process, and we're going to be working uh, whether or not this bill is approved or not. We're going to be working on housing. I mean, that's the bottom line because I think he described the problem very clearly. There is a big problem. You know, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I I um, I kind of I kind of look at things maybe a little differently than some of you on the committee because of my my own personal experience where I actually lost. Uh, we you know my family of twelve we lost our house due to a fire and we were without a place to live for like a year and a half. We kind of couch surfed around and. Uh, I remember my parents trying to find a place and nobody would, uh, they said, well, how many people do you have in your family? I said, 12. No way, we're not going to rent to you guys. Uh, so we ended up in um, um, a pretty small house for a while, while the house was rebuilt. And when the house was rebuilt, my, um, my dad said to my mom, um, well, we have, we have uh, one car, I'm going to sell one of them. I'm going to sell the, one of our two cars, and then I'm going to take the bus. I'm going to take the bus every day to work. And um, my dad did take the bus to work every day for about 35 more years until he was in his 80s. He worked till he was in his 80s. My mom worked till three years ago, and she's 91 now. So. I have that kind of family. What would happen with my dad and the, the family only having one car was that the bus stop was like a block and a half from our house. They moved the bus stop and they eliminated the route. So that kind of threw our family for a loop, the whole planning that we had about and that's just a little story. When I, when I tell that story to people, it's about bus routes. Bus routes, and, and when we look at bus routes, I think over time, this is something I've talked to Senator Winter and many other people, is that when we look at bus routes, we're looking at this decade of change that's going to happen in the next decade. And, and what, what people are saying is that people are going to go to a more personalized choice in terms of transportation. And rather than go to the bus stop, they're going to call a, um, a, a different form of personalized transportation, maybe uh, Uber, Lyft, or maybe uh, there'll be automated vehicles. And well, as that evolves, I think we have to realize that um, what's going to happen is um, a lot of the more localized bus routes are going to not be there anymore. Okay? So I think uh, over time over time, we're going to see this next decade with our energy conservation, our, our 
the things we're doing, there's going to be some changes, okay? But when you build housing, when you build high-rise housing, that's going to be there for a longer time. So we have to make the right planning decisions when we make these decisions. And when I, when I make, and the, and the second thing I want to say is when I make planning decisions, and I'm, I'm a, I worked as a planner, okay? That's what I did before I got elected when I was 28 years old, 37 years ago. Um, I look at things from a social justice litmus test. Housing is a racial issue. You're right, Scott, it is. I don't have to read a book to tell me that. When I was a student at San Jose State, we did surveys on tenants. We found that the black students and uh, Hispanic students were discriminated against a large portion of the time when they tried to rent the apartments around the university. And, and I'll say this, when we talk about housing and, and gentrification and those kinds of issues, those are racial issues. There are racial issues, and Bob Farrell, who I served with on, uh, I was on a committee with Bob, National League of Cities. Bob Farrell was a great leader in Los Angeles when I, when I was a city council member. I admired Bob quite a bit when I was a young uh, elected official to hear him talk about social justice. And Bob, we deserve to go in your community and you set up that meeting and Scott and I and the rest of us will, will attend that meeting. Thank you. Uh, we will, Bob. And um, uh, we, need to, we need to kind of, that's the kind of reaching out we need to do. We need to talk about these things. But the fundamental thing is we need to have a bill and we need to have a bill this coming year. We need to work on these issues and get some consensus and I'll say this, the faster we come to consensus, the faster we can implement the bill. So I don't, I don't view um, this as losing time. I view this as coming up, dealing with this up front so that we can complete the work we need to do to get a good bill and there, thereby be able to implement some of this a little quicker than we would otherwise be able to do working with our local government, our local government partners. So I would like to spend the next year or next uh, several months working with everybody in this committee, Senator Weiner, and all the, the communities in, in California to really fundamentally address this issue. And we have to do it. And so I cannot support Senator Weiner on his bill at this time, but I, I think over, over the next year, we can develop a successful plan to meet the needs of our state of California. So, um, we need a motion for this bill, Senator. Move the bill. So we have a motion on the floor. Um, <laughs> Senator, Senator uh, Weiner. Do you want additional closing remarks? I respectfully ask for an aye vote, Mr. Okay, we'll call the roll, please. This is Senate Bill 827 by Senator Weiner. The motion is due, passed, and we refer to the Committee on Governance and Finance. Senator Bell? No. Bell, no. Canella? No. Canella, no. Allen? No. Allen, no. Dodd? No. Dodd, no. Gaines? Aye. Gaines, aye. Galgiani? Galgiani, no. McGuire? No. McGuire, no. Morell? Morell, aye. Ross? Not voting. Not voting. Skinner? Skinner, aye. Vidak? Wachowski? Weiner? Aye. Weiner, aye. Can we send the vote? It's three to seven. Three to seven. Three votes in favor. Senators, thank you. Uh, can I ask for a reconsideration, Mr. Chair? Reconsideration is granted. No amendments. Thank you. Yes, Senator. Reconsideration. 
do. Do you have to take a vote every day? Next, next week. Oh, I mean, to grant reconsideration. Yeah, you got it. Do we have to take a vote to grant Once you have this consent to reconsider? No, you get reconsideration. No, I do. Four votes. Four votes. Four votes. Four votes. Four votes. Four votes in favor. Thank you, everybody. No. Um, okay, Senator White.